Hamid, you're muted. There you go. There's uh, at least I can I can be heard. <laughs> uh, welcome, folks. Uh, my name is Hamid Khan. I'm with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. I want to uh, welcome you to our webinar today. Uh, which is uh, part nine of our webinar series, uh, Power Not Paranoia, uh, which we started back on March 31st. Um, and uh, one of the key reasons besides, you know, having to get to talk to all of you and, and, and get, to, uh, uh, get to spend some time together was uh, that in, in moments like this, we know that uh, how the police state expands, how the expansion of police powers just goes out of control, how surveillance expands. And, and this also we saw more as a almost a Cointel Pro moment as well. Uh, where uh, you know the the disruptions happen, uh, you know just and and how our movement building uh, basically can get stalled and and what which leads to uh, a further sort of you know regathering of our of our of our uh, uh, movements and people together. So I think this has been a medium that while this is not an ideal situation where we'd love to as organizers we love to meet each other in person. Uh, but yet at the same time, it provides an opportunity to, to keep that momentum going, uh, to have knowledge exchange, uh, and to continue to challenge uh, the current moment and how it, it, uh, it continues to impact our lives uh, in the future. Um, we've, uh, we've had some really uh, awesome uh, webinars on, uh, around science and medicine and rates and surveillance. Um, and also challenging some of the existing paradigms as well, some of the existing uh, narratives where, like, you know, everybody's talking about uh, this is a public health crisis, where we are constantly reminded that for many in our communities, uh, public health is always a crisis. There's always a crisis to access, there's always a crisis to affordability, there's always a crisis to housing, there's always a crisis to, 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 to fresh food and all of that. And today, um, I'm, I'm super, super excited because two of my extremely favorite folks have, have made time. Uh, we have Professor Simone Brown, who is, uh, whose work has inspired uh, the work of uh, Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, uh, a renowned author and an educator. Uh, and I'll, uh, when we start, we'll have Simone introduce herself as well. And we also have uh, Pete, uh, Pete White. I mean, just uh, one of the, I think, one of the most incredible organizers and, and a brother that I have worked with and built with and have known uh, for, for, for quite some time. And really, at this time, I would say, is, is leading the charge in Los Angeles as to how, how we continue organizing, how we continue building power, and how do we continue exposing, and not only exposing uh, the system, uh, but also partnering and providing and, 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 and really sort of like, you know, building that humanity as well. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, just a couple logistical thing. My uh, co-host is Shakir Rahman, um, and uh, we will both be sort of like, you know, managing the logistics here. Uh, the way we have set it up is that because of, uh, you know, Zoom bombing and the other things that happened, uh, as you entered, uh, your camera was on, but uh, the mic is muted. So unfortunately that, you know, just uh, we don't want to police people's voices, but we want to be respectful of the space and we want to be respectful of each other as well. So so as so what's going to happen is that we'll have a conversation with Pete and Simone. It's going to be a free flow conversation and then we'll open it up. Um, and we would ask folks that uh, if you uh, if you have any question or a comment in the meantime, then please go ahead and use uh, use the chat room. Just uh, go ahead and, and, and add your information in the chat room. Um, and then also, uh, uh, in, in a sense, where uh, you are, uh, uh, we already see people think people putting things in the chat room. So you know that's something that um, uh, we're going to have to figure out, like uh, how we we stop that. So you know, let me just take care of that real quick. I, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, all right. So thank you. So um, so then we'll open it up and um, and we'll just get folks to share their thoughts. And it, and if you have a question or a comment, put it in the chat room. Or if you're on the phone, uh, just uh, please go ahead um, and um, and 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 just you can uh, send us a text at five six two two three zero four five seven eight. So with that, 
let's uh, get going and maybe for Simone, if it's okay, maybe if I could just go to you first and, and, and just take a moment and just to introduce yourself and, and how, uh, what's been your journey like and, and really just today's uh, uh, main topic of discussion is around on surveillance and blackness, which we lifted from your book, Dark Matters. Uh, so just in your own personal journey about yourself and, and, and you know, just talk about that. Oh, okay. Thank you so much um, for having me and for you all for um, uh, joining. This is one of my first Zooms. I've done about four of them in these pandemic times, so I'm just kind of learning about uh, these technologies um, as, they, as, they, as they go. But um, I guess my interest was uh, in technology, um, but also in kind of historicizing some of the um, carceral logics of uh, our contemporary surveillance um, society. Um, whether that is, um, you know, looking at the history of the plantation or the surveillance of black folks as they moved um, not only throughout the U.S., but Canada and the Caribbean uh, as well, too, um, in terms of um, uh, freedom, uh, enslavement, uh, resistance, uh, and rebellion. But one of the first things that I was uh, really uh, interested in is, to, is the question of the post-9-11 airport and, and particularly um, security theater. Um, that I that a term that's like a common term to think about how um, you, the, you know the practices and performances of security are often just that. And in our you know our COVID nineteen times, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, technologies. It's being a, you know people call it COVID washing as, as a way to usher in some of these technologies of tracing uh, tracing people. Um, sort of Failing people, whether that's through electronic monitoring for people who have been um, uh, uh, released from incarceration, um, or people that have been said to uh, test negative, or sorry, test positive, or whatever it is for COVID that might um, you know be tracked, whether by phone or or not, or it could be even you know I think the ACLU put out a report um, today or or yesterday on um, kind of questioning the the monitoring of people's temperatures and the privacy concerns um, around. Uh, these types of things, whether this could be done uh, remotely or in public, or if it's something that is, um, you know, a touchless or something that is actually uh, comes up close in the body, like a kind of forehead monitor and these types of things. And so, um, you know, for me, I, I, I wanted to, uh, to look at these uh, technologies, um, to think about their antecedents and, and look at the ways that people also, um, you know, challenged, lived with and resisted um, and got by uh, 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 when it comes to surveillance technologies. And so that's the kind of work that I was, uh, that I, that I do. Um, at this moment, I'm just kind of, uh, it, it's a lot. So I'm just kind of thinking, um, there are a lot of people that I look to, like um, Chris Gallard, uh, that uh, some, uh, hyper visible on Twitter that is always, you know, up on it in terms of um, what we should be looking out for uh, when it comes to the tracking and monitoring of people um, in these times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, uh, uh, as a way in this current moment, of course, like you know, as as you, we, we're building this thing, um, I, I want to go back to some of the stuff that you had written and go back to the book uh, Dark Matters and where you talk about uh, where you talk about uh, uh, in relation surveillance in relation to transatlantic uh, slavery and how it informs and drives uh, policing and uh, almost every aspect of our lives in the U.S. in this current moment. So, so uh, it, now that that's one moving part. Then the other piece is that as we are looking at the existing impact, particularly on the Black community and of course the Navajo Nation, uh, 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 how do, how do you like looking at this whole trajectory over the last 500 years? Uh, of course, there's a whole lot of time to cover. But uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that we we always talk about in the coalition is about not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. Uh, so, 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 uh, but what are your thoughts about that? You know, when I ask that question, um, I, like the image comes to mind. Um, New York was like kind of a focus um, uh, in my book, and I think it was maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, it was this hot weather, seeing all these things on the news of um, the the. The various ways in which different communities um, have been policed there uh, around masks, like, like police handing out masks to seemingly white um, people that are sitting in the park or so, um, you know, not social distancing, whereas, um, you know, uh, black folks being tackled, having more arrests and more citations. And so, as you say, it's like the kind of changing same or the historical presence of those type of, you know, uh, 
um, policing uh, practices, um, you know, uh, in in this in the in the COVID moment. And so, um, you know, and and to to think about like that it's 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 a lot of like anticipatory grief um that we're that we're that you're seeing when we're watching the news um uh of the amount of people whether they are um said to be frontline workers that are that are you know risking their lives so other people can stay home and have uh you know delivered groceries or so um and at the same time um the 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 images on the news and the stories that we um you know we hear about of um you know uh, whether it was um Ahmed Aubrey um, uh, being killed, or uh, Breonna Taylor, the, AM, the EMT worker in um, uh, Kentucky uh, with a no-knock warrant, um, who was, uh, you know, sh shot to death uh, a, a, a little while back. And so, all of those kinds of uh, those moments um, of, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what to make of that at that moment. But there's a lot of, uh, it's really heavy, and there's a lot of, you know, grief and 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 to, to, to kind of place those in in a logics of, of white supremacy, um, it's, 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 you know, I guess it's, it's a challenge. I don't have an answer for, for that question now, but those are all the things that I'm, when you think about like the visual economy of these, of uh, what's going on now, it's, it's pretty heavy. So Pete, uh, let's, uh, so Simone just used the term anticipatory grief, um, and which is, which is uh, heavy, which is deep, which is, which has a lot, a lot of resonance. So I, I want to just, uh, uh, I want you to, to, to pick on that, move with that. I think I can pick on it. I think I could, uh, I think I can build from that. I don't want to pick on it like well, that. Well, I mean build on that. I mean, that's, well, English has my second language, excuse me. <laughs> uh, so I think, um, I think before I sort of pick on that, thank you everyone for uh, choosing this webinar this evening. I know we are living in Zoom land and you have lots of options to choose. Um, and thank you for sort of joining us. I would also just like to say thank you to Simone uh, for joining us and just giving us these pearls of wisdom, uh, right? Um, that, that are, that's really important to allow us to understand sort of surveillance from, from a lantern, right? To this whole new sort of aggressive architecture, right? And understanding that those two things are the same thing, right? I think for me, um, particularly when we're thinking about surveillance and policing um, during the COVID-19 pandemic moment is, is sort of encapsulated by this real image, this real scene that happened. Uh, so like two weeks ago, the city of Los Angeles thought that it was a good idea to start testing primarily African Americans, Black people, in front of the LA Community Action Network headquarters without telling anyone anything, right? They just set up shop, right? And this scene was like a scene from Contagion, right? And so you had um, the, you had like 12 um, um, paramedics, EMT vehicles. You had police vehicles, at least 12, 13 of them. You had Department of uh, Health personnel, just all dispatched in this one central place in Skid Row, right? And you had um, police tape up, you had shields, you had white dudes in full hazmat suits. And one of the neighborhood residents walked up to the line at the top of his voice said, I see white people in full hazmat suits talking about they're here to help us. I ain't going nowhere near that, right? And so it was that scene, right? But when I, when I further interrogated the scene, right, I, I had to think about so who were essential personnel? And what were their roles on our block for five days without first alerting community that you would be there, right? If you were there um, for the goodness of the community and understanding the cultural complications that you would run into when the government 
comes into a black or brown and native community and says, we're here to test you, um, you would think that you would ask for help. But when they arrived, I saw like three official folks from the Department of Public Health and the rest police. And so one had to think, so why are the police here, right? Now we, we continue to see this movement to cast the police as social workers, as therapists, as counselors, right? But the idea that they had some real role in the medical application of testing was tricky because we know they did not, right? Because we know that because police were there shoulder to shoulder with healthcare providers, all HIPAA protections were immediately lost. And no one cared about that, right? The idea that the police had real-time access to personal and private information that could certainly be used against people and will be used against people in their web of surveillance and intimidation was on full display. Mm -hmm. And community saw it and understood it and stayed away, right? The headlines would read um, after that, that Skid Row residents just didn't want to be tested. And the folks that were in the line uh, were not from Skid Row, those few people that were tested, to which I applauded because that was probably the best decision one could make because nowhere else, I'm sure, in the city, if they were there to test, would the testers be assisted by folks with batons and guns who are there to collect information. Also, in this moment of COVID-19, uh, query, I, I think a lot about sort of the quasi moratorium on the Fourth Amendment, and I say quasi because there's always, for them, a moratorium on the Fourth Amendment that's sort of linked to investigation into wearing masks or, or, or what I, I would consider mask inquiries. Mm. Do you have a mask on? Don't you have a mask on? What's in your pocket? Who are you talking to? Right? Are you social distancing? Are you not social distancing? And we see these, we see these, um, these scenes on re on repeat from Brooklyn in New York to South Central to Jesse Owens Park here. So not only are we seeing sort of the full scale violation of all HIPAA and all these other things, but we're seeing a wholesale they see a wholesale opportunity to further engage, document, um, and assail our communities. And there's, you know, the last little piece, and I'll be done, I swear I'm done, um, is sort of um, the, de the, the discretionary curfew violations for further engagement and ultimately um, information sharing um, mm -hmm. between sort of law enforcement and their extended architecture or a network of surveillance through courts and public entities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we'll keep on building on that then, uh, uh, Pete, uh, that, uh, and, and I wanted to, and so this is something I'm gonna lift off of uh, Simone's work as well, um, where, uh, you know, just, uh, and, and you write about that, how technologies and surveillance technologies and practices are informed by the long history of racial formation and by the methods of policing black life under slavery, such as branding, uh, runaway slave notices, and lantern laws. So now, uh, here we are in the world of contact tracing. Here we are in the world of immunity passports. Here we are in the world of uh, syndromic surveillance. Here we are in the world of serological surveillance. Center. I mean, you name it. There's a whole mm -hmm. vocabulary that we are being introduced to. Uh, so let's 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 go back into our community in Skid Row, um, and which is overwhelmingly black. And and you know just so so how do you? I mean, with that history in mind, in, in a sense, 
absolutely it makes sense for the community to say like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, this, is, this ain't happening right now because first you show up as robots. So clearly the other has been established. The hostile has been established, right? In, in full like robotic uniform. And then, so, so how, so, so talk about that, you know, building on, on Simone's scholarship and there's this current modalities of contact tracing and, the, and immunity passports. I mean, you know, in short, when, when I think about when I think about contact tracing um, and the unknowns lurking in each encounter, rendering extended networks vulnerable, right? And so, contact tracing for us becomes the way in, right? But it's also on the other side of contact tracing is not giving a damn at all, right? Is sort of black death, right? Mm -hmm. We're not testing. Um, we're going to allow people to rot, to die, right? We're going to, I think the, I think the stat that I saw today, 60% of deaths in this country was of black and brown people of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that isn't, none of that's about contact tracing. That's about um, being really clear about those folks are the other, those folks are expendable, right? Those folks have no value. But if folks were engaged in robust contact tracing, it is, it is definitely a threat, right? Because when, when I think about, all right, so who is Pete White connected to, right? If I did a genogram of Pete White, like who are all, where are all the places that I could potentially be that would render other folks vulnerable um, if I tested positive? And for me, it's not even about testing positives, right? It's about this becomes an opportunity to create networks or to create um, other interventions or not interventions, other ways into your private networks. And so I think about, when I think about uh, Simone's work in the contemporary fashion, I think about Bill Bratton, right? Mm -hmm. uh, coming to Skid Row. Uh, to the LAPD Central Division, where he has, you know, he invites community folks or community leaders, I don't know why he invited me, and social service providers to tell him how he would tame Skid Row. And a lot of the folks, uh, white men who left corporate America to do their charitable work at these missions, at the tune of $200,000, that's charity, right, to run these missions, what they really wanted to know is how are you going to enforce in Skid Row, right? Because they were all about the enforcement, the removal, the banishment of those who didn't comply with their theological beliefs or who weren't inside of their doors. Bill Bratton looked at them squarely and said, this is not all about arrests. We will get to arrest. This is about papering everyone up so we know who is here and we understand their vulnerabilities. And so the pretext there is what he's saying is through um, FI cards, right, and through stops and through data sharing, right, through sort of um, social service providers and parole and probation and sheriffs, we will know who is here. And once mm -hmm. we know who is here, we will understand the set of vulnerabilities they possess as individuals, but as a community as well, right? And so when we think about surveillance and when we think about sort of the ways in which they come into our community, oftentimes we think about it as a very uh, individualized, a very personal thing, um, but their goal, it's not personal at all. It's personal, but it's also about the removal of communities. And so in real time practice, watching a, a Bill Bratton led broken windows policing strategy rolled out in the ways in which surveillance would work. And then the last thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. The, the last thing that was really, really odd um, about some of the tactics around uh, sort of the broken policing and the ways, uh, the ways in which um, clothing, culture, language 
um, has always been a tool, or those modes have been tools used to attempt to surveil us. And of course, I won't give a no game, zero game about how wrong they always are on that shit on here, but it was very interesting in uh, one of their attempts to identify folks as gang members and felons and drug dealers and drug runners. And this is what they said. They were like, just identify folks with clean white socks. Mm. Everyone with clean white socks, because they're in Skid Row, got to be a drug dealer, got to be a drug runner, got to be a gang banger, right? And you have now greenlit, you are now greenlit to engage those folks, come up with something. Now, all of that, notwithstanding the fact that you have all sorts of charitable clothing donations going on and all sorts of socks happening, but the ways in which they use culture, they used in Skid Row, socks as a way to in identify targets, to surveil, identify targets. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to take a, a quick moment here because people have been texting that uh, people are posting stuff, and I'm, and it's it's ironic that of course we were able to block off the annotation side and the and the whiteboard side, and the screen sharing side, but I think it's also a reminder. It's 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 uh, I'm going to flip the script about our power. Uh, that nah, you know, fuck you. You know, you, know what I mean? it's a, it's a, you can you can zoom bomb us. We've been bombed. We've been like, you know, just like no, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. We're here. So yeah. So do, do do whatever the fuck you want to do. So yeah. But that. But of course, the well, we had to be very respectful of the space. We had to turn the chat off. So uh, if uh, folks have any comments or something as we get into that, please raise your hand or whatever that function is in the Zoom. But another thing learned by the, uh, the chat box. Um, but uh, so Simone, just uh, let's, uh, uh, you know, just looking at that and, and you, you also, uh, but let's, let's just for, for, in, for information sort of like, you know, some of your scholarship, uh, talk about when you uh, make this relationship between branding and biometrics and passports and, uh, you know, uh, runaway slave notices. Uh, you know, I, I would love for you to just like share it with, with our uh, folks as well who are on this call. Like, you know, what was, uh, what was, the, the, uh, what was the underlying themes that were, that were going through your head as you were, as you were um, putting it on paper? Yeah, I think I was just maybe started looking at biometric technology in 2001 and when it was looked at as a kind of way of uh, securing borders, securing spaces, but really it was about like the, about, a, the race, about the racial body and whose body gets marked as, you know, always um, uh, in need of security, in need of, um, uh, I don't know what to say, but you know the, how white supremacy operates is like this. It's like the logic of biometric technology is like the logic of white supremacy, and I wanted to mm. kind of see it in other spaces as opposed to like your fingerprints and your iris scanner and your facial recognition, um, you know, technology. And so, so that was to to, to think about um, the branding of enslaved people as as a form of identification, as a measure of as an attempt to um, dehumanize. Um, uh, uh, people uh, turn them into commodities or objects, um, and 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 to kind of maybe look at biometrics uh, on on that angle. But also, um, you know, when we think about biometric surveillance now, those are the things that you, um, you know, you, syndromic surveillance, this uh, contact tracing, all of these uh, ways that, again, um, with the story that um, Pete uh, told us in that imagery of the hazmat suit, it's like whose body gets marked as contagion, um, as dangerous. You know, at the beginning and even uh, right now, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of continuing that you're seeing, um, you know, um, anti-Asian racism, um, whether it's coming from the administration, the news media, from people on the streets, the attacks, you're seeing the kind of um, uh, indigenous uh, 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 
maybe in the reporting kind of the erasure of the effects of, uh, of COVID um, on uh, various uh, communities uh, and nations. And also kind of, the, you know, the absenting of, uh, in, I guess, the numbers that are coming out of some of these uh, hotspots, places like New York, of, um, you know, Afro-Latinx uh, people and how they're being counted in, um, uh, you know, who is being affected, um, uh, not only by uh, COVID in terms of, um, uh, of their health, but also in terms of, um, you know, who, who's being uh, kicked out of their homes, who's not, who's not getting access um, to, to relief, who's not being counted um, in those moments and being traced into the absence of uh, as well. And so the, 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 the biometric technology thing was, uh, you know, something I'm still seeing, um, you know, in this moment, um, when it's, uh, you know, whether it's going to be, um, you know, remote checking of temperatures in, um, in, in public spaces without any type of consent. So who gets to opt in or opt out of that? And, you know, but back to what Pete said in that moment of the hazmat suits, it, I'm sure at the same time, it was when like these white folks with guns, whether it's in whatever whatever state that they're you know whether it's in michigan or other states where they're unmasked and they're protesting um because this COVID has been marked as um you know a disease for racialized folks and for and for and then and, and you know i don't need to wear a mask i'm wearing a mask is for for certain folks for um white supremacist folks, white folks, or whoever, it is uh, for many a sign of, I don't know what it is, some kinds of masculinity, some types of um, uh, an exercise of power, really. Um, and, and, and because, you know, these, these chickens do come home to roost um, at certain times. But for, for now, I think it's when we, when we think about, um, you know, contact tracing, we have to also, uh, and I, this is the work that you all are doing, of course, is the work of like uh, the tracing of care as in, in these communities that are being, um, you know, um, basically, you know, attacked by um, not only this disease, but um, the, the various ways it's getting taken up uh, globally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, um, in a sense, and, and I want to just uh, bring these together because the experience that uh, uh, Pete uh, shared about uh, them showing up, um, and you know, a lot of times, uh, Simone, we speak about uh, policing in the context of counter counterinsurgency, um, that how the, the, the hostiles, the insurgents, the, the, the other, uh, have to be dealt with. So that's why, you know, I mean, our journey is towards abolition of policing and we don't do uh, any reform work. Uh, so now we are in this moment and, and I want to just uh, uh, build upon uh, this, this practice of and, and ta tactics of counterinsurgency uh, that where uh, a whole community in a sense uh, uh, is again being pathologized and demonized as well because I think the language that we are hearing out there is now very much sort of couched in this, in biological terms, um, you know, which is about predisposition, susceptibility. Uh, uh, and, and, and so that's one piece. And the other piece uh, is also, and this is, uh, you know, our, our comrade uh, Jamie Garcia talks about, who's on the front line of service delivery as well, as, as an organizer also in the coalition, as, but also as a nurse, that, you know, that this is, this is something that, what, what about the rest of the stuff that is going on? What about the, the rest of the ailments? What about access to services? What about like, you know, so how is that impacting people as well? But in a sense, we are looking at this, this major, almost, I've, I don't want to use the foul language, but I think that it's almost like a big clusterfuck that, that is happening right now. So how does, so with the impact on the community where you have these kind of insurgency methods, then accessibility is being reduced over and over again. Uh, there's a demonization going on. So a stage is being set. And, and I'm trying to wrap my head around like, you know, what kind of stage is being set to further demonize and pathologize uh, 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 the black community? Either one, Pete, uh, Simone. That's a good question. You know, what Pete will go first. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Simone. It's all know. you. It's all I, you. I, you know, sometimes I'm thinking like it's maybe a stage is that stage has already been there, but there's you know that's the, people break the stage and set other things, and then maybe I'm just like looking at the work that you all are doing, the work that Miriam Kaba is doing, the continual like work for the hope of something else in, in, in terms of abolition or another way of living that, um, yeah, I think that it's, it's back to how we began that that stage is the, is the historical present. It's the, it's the changing same. And so maybe it's time to, you know, to, to just break down that stage. Pete? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why, thanks, Simone. I mean, so I, I think to me, uh, it's, it's all about folks who are deemed disposable, right? Um, it's very interesting, if we recall, um, the narrative first was that Tom Hanks has COVID-19, right? And then it was Prince Charles or Prince William or one of the royals has COVID-19. And, and so at that moment, the pandemic or the disease was cast as this very wealthy, white, traveled thing, right? And that narrative was just like out there, like boom. And people of color, black folks, brown folks, and others suck that game up, right? I'm gonna call it a game. They sucked it up. We sucked it up. It was like, yo, we ain't gotta worry about that. That ain't got nothing to do with us, right? But then as the numbers started sliding out, out of Missouri, one, I'm 100% black. Mm -hmm. Chicago, black and brown folks falling down. New York, it became more difficult to hide the lie, right? And so instead of hiding the lie, the narrative changed to, well, if 1% of the population dies, what does that matter? Reopen the economy, right? That lie shifts when they understand, when they, when they make public the understanding of who's being paralyzed and crippled by the pandemic. So I say all that to say, like, for them, it is a very conscious decision, right, to, to make this a thin the, the people of color herd strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Even with the reopen the economies and all of that, that is really more about their understanding of the communities that are being laid down by this pandemic. The problem is we are still playing catch up with empirical data, right? We are still playing catch up in terms of the impact. So we still got, we still got folks in our community who still aren't, well, that's Tom Hanks in them, right? Mm -hmm. Not realizing that those, um, those untreated preventable conditions, asthma, hypertension, and all of these other things are putting our communities greater at risk. And so at some point, for me, Hamid, it becomes more designed than not, right? When I think about, um, when I think about this, this, this sort of, um, there's a scale, that, that a sociological scale that shows who are liked people in our society and who are despised, right? But it also shows who are valued, mm -hmm. who are exploited, and who are marked for death. Black folks have been marked for death for a long time. After, after our utility, right, in plantation capitalism, the exploitation of our labor was gone and occupied by someone else, we became surplus labor. And now it's like, for Black folk and Brown folks, if you play dominoes, right, if you sit around a domino table and you're getting your butt whooped, whoever's at the domino table who's winning, they will say, who got next, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a who got next moment for those who have been deemed disposable. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Black and Brown folks are leading the pack mm -hmm. of disposability. Absolutely. I mean, we were looking at the Navajo Nation and the impact on the Navajo Nation is, is absolutely just crazy, out, out of control. Uh, and, and I'm reminded in one of our previous seminars, I don't know whether it was Beta or, or uh, one of the, our public health comrades, uh, talked about the history about uh, uh, that in the context of medicine where the black body was always as a subject and not a patient. Um, and I think that really, really, in a sense that where we are right now, that the experimentation uh, where you're not treated as, as, as a patient, but rather as a subject uh, to kind of build uh, that sort of you know, sense of scholarship and, and medic medical science and, and everything else. Uh, so then, um, so as by design, let's 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 keep on talking about it a little bit more. Like, what is a design? And Simone, you, I, I heard you speak about uh, I, I don't know someplace where you you talked about, and I made a note for myself uh, that that relationship between blacks and properties and, and the use of the term stay, staying there. So in a sense, the the expression and 
and the relationship with property is like it's not about ownership so there, there's a, there's a transition constantly and, and, mm -hmm. and a temporariness that is always existing so so in this moment here we are and of course like you know a lot of the policing work that we have done is really i mean exposing the underlying the underlying intent around settler colonialism because it is about di displacement it is about gentrification it's not about public safety it's about banishment so now bringing that the terminology that you've lifted around stay and the relationship with property so so yeah i just wanted to see uh, just to talk about that a little bit uh, sure. Um, I, I think a lot of people have, 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 have talked about that term. It was like when I first moved to the um, to the U.S., my students would ask me where you stay at. And it's kind of like to, to understand the relation to um, uh, to the South, to to um, uh, to, the, to their relation to the city there. Um, but, you know, something that uh, that Pete uh, just said just now about like people being marked for death and um, who got next. And I saw I'm going to do a kind of circular thing and maybe get back to, to, to your question. But I saw an ad today, um, it was for um, Amazon. And they were, Jeff Bezos was looking for workers. They didn't have to have any employment history, um, any type of um, uh, uh, work skills, but that is like, that is the kind of disposable labor um, that this moment is um, desiring. When, when I see um, the people that are delivering for UPS or USPS or FedEx or any type of person that's putting themselves at risk to, um, to deliver, for, for many people, they're um, necessary goods. And, for, and sometimes they're just like not stuff that, that people need at this moment that, that's worth someone um, you know, risking their life. It's, it's often racialized folks that are, um, that are doing um, this work, um, who, whose bodies are being you know, um, put on the line. And so, to think about, um, I guess, the relation of place and who can stay in place, um, who can shelter in place, um, who can socially distance, who can mm -hmm. have, you know, access to um, uh, toilet paper, uh, hand sanitizer, these types of things. Um, it's, it's, uh, this moment is uh, really, um, I guess, I guess ratcheting up or exacerbating um, those those existing you know inequalities and whose labor can continually be kind of like uh, almost like a like who's next basically who got next here because it's it's a disposable um, you know type of labor and mm -hmm. if, if, I remember the the, the story of the um, a young woman uh, I forgot what state that she was working in but she was uh, I think probably at a Trader Joe's or one of these grocery stores um, a frontline worker and um, and when, when and she died of the COVID nineteen and when her mother got her final paycheck it was like twenty six dollars or something like that wow. you know and so um, those types of uh, you know uh, labor relations um, and then, then the people who can't um, uh, you know I recently saw I think there was a uh, some arrests that were happening in New York um, today. Or yesterday of people who um, are um, said to be undocumented uh, making money you know trying to survive who don't have access to the kind of uh, certain relief projects that are available in some of the states um, who are being again policed uh, in this um, you know pandemic moment mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so a lot of stage is being set uh, uh, so Pete let's go back to the design piece because you triggered uh, a bunch of thoughts uh, when you when you uh, use that term um, that obviously, given the, the state of the economy, uh, given the massive rate of unemployment, given who's going to be cut first, um, and given the, this current assault on the Postal Service, I mean, for example, like, you know, how there's this, 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 this drama that is going on in front of us. Um, so the stage, in a sense, that I'm thinking by design is, again, like what we saw, almost the loss of, of property, loss of homes. Uh, we're looking at uh, 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 increase in, in uh, the unhoused population as well. So in a sense that letting it play out rather than providing meaningful interventions, you know, and of course we don't want to go down a journey of any conspiracies, but you know, I mean, <laughs> anything is possible when it comes to race and poverty and suspect bodies. That's what we talk about. It's the policing. Anything is possible. So none of that is any conspiracy at all. Um, given the, the the violence and the cruelty of white supremacy. Um, so it, we already see, and this is a work that we had been exposing through our work as well about the, the, the banishment and the, and the displacement of communities in South Central and various other communities. So how do you see this, this design, this, this stage that is being set as we, as we move into our next phase? Yeah, I think, um, 
I'm going to do a Simone Brown. I'm going to go back to something she said and come right back to you. Please, please, please. And so, and so when, like, the bells were going off, Simone, when you were just talking about um, labor um, and Bezos and Amazon, I saw, like, $2,500 a week, right? And this idea, and, I, and, and I'm thinking about our housing work um, post-Hurricane Katrina, right? And I'm thinking about the disaster economy and who's pushed to the front of the line in the most horrendous conditions, only to either die from those conditions, but, or when things return to normal, are the first to be removed and placed back in their station, right? And so I look at the, I look at the Amazon workers, um, I look at other frontline workers and outreach workers and other folks who are just being called in, right? Um, we've been waiting on you all of our lives. We found resources for y'all because we really care about y'all at a moment when you're at greatest risk of life and limb, right? And so just being really clear um, that the moment of um, these false moments of opportunity, right, uh, for black, brown, disadvantaged, organized, abandoned communities is nothing less also as a setup, putting them in hazard's way, right? Like, mm. because they're disposable, back to disposable. I think the design though, right, whether it's Hurricane Katrina, the pandemic, a mortgage meltdown uh, mm -hmm. that impacts black and brown. Like when we think about South Central Los Angeles and we think about whose communities were decimated um, as a result of these, uh, of these exotic loan structures, it was head of households, largely black and brown women mm -hmm. who were holding it down. Who were the beneficiaries, right? Were white corporations who were responsible for the mortgage meltdown, who would then come back, buy up all of the properties using the bailout dollars and rent those properties back to people of color and black people until white folks showed up and then raised the rent so high that there is no room at the end for anyone but those who they are attracting. And so I tell that story because that is the design that we see play out over and over again. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not on the, I'm not the conspiracy theorist that's saying, yo, the pandemic was brought just for that. But I am the person to say um, that the capitalists and others know an opportunity when they see one, mm -hmm. right? And they are organized in such a manner where they can begin to move the resources to bolster their institutions, their structures, and their wealth as they rank, as they strangle the life, the life that's left out of our communities. Mm -hmm. Now, with that being said, I will also say that there has been an incredible amount of mutual aid and um, support that's been given by a broader and I can only speak for Los Angeles, but a broader Los Angeles community, which I see as an opportunity to organize, to build power, to build theory, to build alternative systems of care. Because what they have shown us is that there are resources that exist if they feel threatened, if their existence feels threatened. And I'm not gonna talk much more about that, with all the N words is being thrown up here, with you know, all the folks who are, are, are mining us right now. But I will just say there are opportunities for our movement as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's uh, uh, as we move into bringing everybody into the conversation, I want to I want to move into that with the two of you around the opportunities. But uh, but before um, you know, one of the things, uh, Simone, uh, uh, and, and this is something that I, um, uh, let me just see if uh, we have that. Uh, we, let me just see where it went. I wanted to pull up a, uh, uh, there you go. Um, 
so let me just go to this real quick. Uh, yeah. So when we release this report uh, before the bullet hits the body, um, we we basically I mean we started uh, and this is the start of the first page and we started off with the. Um, um, uh, with with with, your, with a quote from uh, from your book that surveillance is nothing new to black folks. It is the fact of anti-blackness, and you know that sort of like has been a, a really 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 such a guide to speak about like you know that why reform doesn't work, why did reform doesn't work, and 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 even challenging uh, a lot of folks within the movement as well that any police reform would be inherently anti-black to begin with, because any, any reform would maintain a system of violence, would maintain a system of control, would maintain a system of constant policing of the body. So, uh, so of course, you know, I mean, you, you're, you, you sort of tracing that history of surveillance, but here we are in 2020, and there's still, uh, you know, white-led institutions who are deeply involved in reform work, who are constantly pushing uh, under the guise of accountability, under the guise of transparency, under the guise of public participation, under the guise of, uh, of various other things. So uh, I, I, want, I want you to just address that, like, you know, that, 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 that what is it, like in our, in our fights, of course, and we are very clear about it. We are very clear about like, you know, this, this whole issue that any reform work would be inherently anti-black. So I wanted to hear your thoughts. Uh, okay. <laughs> My thoughts on any reform work being inherently anti-black. I think that's the, that's the, I think that statement, um, you know, um, answers it. Uh, so um, can you give me an example? <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example right now. So in a sense where, so, so a lot of times we are being, oops, uh, where did I go? Oops, wait a minute. Uh, sorry for that. That's that. Okay, there we are. So right now we are being confronted by the ACLUs of the world, by the EFFs of the world, and various other white uh, privileged institutions who are pushing police reform. Like there's a whole there's a whole uh, legislative piece that they're that they're driving uh, called community control over police surveillance, C cops, right? And of course, it's couched in this whole language of, um, of, of uh, transparency and accountability. And our experience in Los Angeles has shown that, you know, we have, so the oversight body has been since 1926 with full subpoena powers. So, but it's completely a, it, it, it's more of a shock absorber of the system more than anything else. And public participation is limited to two minutes of, of your commentary. So I think it's from that vantage point that in our journey to, towards abolition, and we've been able to, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a long journey. It, it's a long fight, it's a drawn out fight, but we were able to dismantle, uh, and I wanna honor uh, the leadership of my comrade, Jamie Garcia and other team members in data-driven policing, uh, who led the fight around this thing of dismantling predictive policing, but we dismantled that, right? We, didn't, we did not negotiate that kinder, gentler, Brett Bowler and predictive policing. And I'll, and, I'll, and, and I'll bring you to property and land as well and show you exactly what was going on. So it's in that vein uh, that we have been challenging and this currently right now, as of yesterday or the, uh, last week, the ACLU was pushing this piece in Pasadena for the Pasadena uh, a police department to incorporate a civilian control or a police surveillance type garbage. So I think in a sense, people have sort of like, you know, just looked at us and said like, well, gee, you know, I mean, why don't we, why don't we give it a chance? Well, how can you give it a chance? I mean, under what pretext should we give it a chance? So that's where we, are, we were coming from. Yeah, so I'm in agreement with you there. <laughs> so I, I feel like what there's, you know, what, under what pretext do you give that a chance? So you dismantle Predpol in one place, but it's like whack-a-mole and it's on all these, you know, other cities are um, taking it up. So it has to be, um, you know, uh, in, in the same way that, that, that they're like whack-a-mole, I think, you know, other kinds of organizing groups have to be like that too, and they are, um, you know, uh, using their same tactics, pushing up against, um, uh, you know, these reformist things. And I think in, you know, some of the work that I've been seeing in terms of people questioning 
the, the framing of something around artificial intelligence and fairness or good systems and, um, and those, you know, other spaces uh, in which, um, you know, people are challenging that. Because an abolitionist perspective wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, take up reform. And so um, I, think that, I think that's basically, you know, all I have to, to, uh, to, to say about, about that, though. But I appreciate the work that people are doing in that area. Pete, do you have any, you have a comment on that? Nope, I agree. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so now what we're gonna do is, um, uh, we were going to, I'm gonna go to, uh, Jamie, did you have any uh, questions or comments to start off with? I know that, um, and I'm gonna go to some of our people as well and then see if they have any thoughts. Uh, uh no, I, I really have been enjoying and um, extremely appreciating this conversation. And I think now as we, um, as the coalition transitions into um, going after LAPD and as we continue to go after LAPD, but with their data, um, data informed community focused policing, what we're seeing is this kind of manufactured consent where they're trying to basically drive interventions based on community input, right? And they kind of have determined and shaped who this, what this community looks like. And it's very surprising in their reports and in the pseudo academia that they're trying to push now because they see that, you know, as they become further and further delegitimized by community members and, um, and exposed, continually exposed, they are having to shape some type of um, legitimacy, right? And so you see terms like collective efficacy, social cohesion being used and these ideas of who is the community, right? Who gets to drive what type of surveillance or what type of mitigation tactics are used um, in communities. And I'm surprised and just been talking to, you know, different folks today, how um, it's very obvious the shaping of the community is in their own reports are men, our property owners are those who have access to education, those who are not on general relief. And these people have a tendency to be the people who are committed to their communities, want to see change in their communities, want to belong into their communities. And everybody else is a drifter. Everybody else doesn't really care, doesn't really belong. And this, this, so this manufactured, you know, this, this is the community and these are the partnerships they want to form with us. And I think that is the, um, that's this kind of very, um, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not losing words right now, but it's a very um, insidious way to move policing because where we talk about community control of policing, it, it again is trying to play on that context that this is what the community wants. If the community had control over this type of surveillance, it could, it could monitor who it wanted to. It could use it for, you know, certain purposes. So I think that this type of um, pseudo academia, these types of um, structures need to be really seen also so that we can break them. And that was one of the biggest things that in the campaign that I was, um, that I you know, was a part of is that how do we continue to expose these things so people can actually you know, grab them and break them? Because then if not, we keep seeing them resurface and keep seeing them resurface. And in this next um, iteration that LAPD is laying out, I think they've given us this opportunity to expose not only past practices of broken windows policing, uh, racial profiling, but they're trying to bring it all together in this comprehensive form of policing now that is going, going to, and I feel, allow us to, to lay out all the histories and to really um, show people all of these various ways and how they're bringing them together. But I think um, even down to what is the most um, interesting component, they have a community survey that's called Elucid. And within it is a mapping of sentiment. It's sentiment mm. mapping. So now, you know, with all the various types of mapping they're already doing in our communities, they want to map where people are hostile towards police and where people are in agreement with police. And so again, we see this kind of, you know, and the way they're laying it out is like, oh, well, this is the sentiments. We want to know so that we can connect with these people more, but we see that as counterinsurgency. This is where they get to map who, and not only who you are in your community, who do you know, how much money do you make, where do you live, do you rent, do you not, but what do you think about us? And then based mm -hmm. on that, their interventions begin. And so we have to be laying these out so when these 
reformists come along and say, well, if we can control that, if we could get community input, then police could have this great relationship. But really what it is, is just further mapping of us so they know how to deploy their troops in order to better control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Shakir, do you have any, any, any comments or any questions for Pete and Simone? Um, yeah, well, just one thing I thought I'd add about this, the, what Jamie was just talking about, this report that just came out. So this is basically LAPD's kind of, uh, they're laying out their vision for what their uh, future of data-driven policing, or it's now called data-informed community-based policing, is the, is the new term. I think they're trying to just make it hard to organize against by making it hard to uh, use the whole name, but they, you know, one thing, Hamid was asking this question using uh, Professor Brown's quote about the, the facts of blackness and how police reform work can always be anti-black. You see that even in this report that so much of what they're proposing that they're going to do now is very much in the language of reform and, and, and kind of even the demands that reformers have made talking about we are going to be introducing all kinds of accountability metrics and um, data about our use of force and police decisions will be kind of informed by that. That's all, those are all things that kind of have been part of the, like what reformers have been asking about is that if we have more data and if we have more accountability for police based on early warning systems about, okay, this officer uses force X many times, that kind of thing, then then that's going to help address or end police violence. But what we're seeing very much is they're like, oh yeah, okay, we'll do that. And we'll bake that into this whole system that's giving us more power, more authority, more surveillance, and the whole apparatus is kind of data driven and, and ultimately more powerful than when, um, than when, you know, what reformers found. So um, yeah, so that's kind of an example. And we were just, we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with those, uh, hearing those, those comments, um, Simone and, uh, and Pete, uh, you know, we see, because a lot of times, like today I was, uh, I was speaking to somebody and, and they're, they're writing an article and they had contacted uh, and wanted our opinions about this notion of contact tracing and the various types of the surveillance apparatus that is being set up. And, and, I, and I heard myself speaking about it, saying that contact tracing is almost like a see something, say something on steroids in, in a way, where like what, where it would take us and what would it mean uh, to us and to our communities. Uh, so, so now that is, that is one piece under, in, in the COVID situation. Then you have this expansion of this deep data-driven policing, which is, you know, just speculative and hunch-based because what it does is that it assigns criminality. Like, you know, it just basically, it's, it's the, it's, which is nothing new because an, and mass assignment of criminality is there. Third piece is, which, which of course, like has been the biggest fight um, or one of the big fights for, for LA Can and, and all of us in, in Skid Row is this constant e expansion and gentrification and displacement of the communities as well, which is now happening in many other neighborhoods. So in a sense, I want to go back to the design and the stage and of course, breaking the stages, but under the guise of COVID and an extension of where this the these mega surveillance apparatus that is being set up, where using what, what Jamie was lifting, it's almost like and manufacturing consent from people as well because yes, please surveil me, and it's it's way more heightened than 9/11. It's way because now everybody is afraid of dying, <laughs> like it's right here. So how do you, in a sense, um, you know the tra the trajectory that you draw, and I want to go back to the black body, which is central to surveillance um, and, and how these systems have been developed. How do you see it, it, it moving now? What, what, um, what, I forgot the term that Jamie uh, Garcia just mentioned, but around kind of like mapping affect onto spaces um, uh, in very racialized way as, 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 as who feels nice about the police, who feels they're sweet and who feels a kind of antagonistic relationship um, that is already socially constructed. So it's like, it's, it's like, um, a kind of, I, forget the, I, guess the, I guess the word that sometimes acad academics use is like a tautological, but this, it's like, it's like a, sorry, my, it's probably nine or 10 o'clock where I am a bit <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, they, it's a, a manufacturing consent is, is the term um, um, that you, uh, that you use there. But to see those types of, um, the kinds of uh, surveillance of affect being mapped onto um, uh, new policing tactics. Um, uh, what Shakir called, it's data-driven, data-informed, 
a kind of like hodgepodge of language to, as you said, to make it more difficult to, to make an acronym and organize against, but people are still, you know, against it. But you map those on to some of the other types of technologies that we're seeing being used, um, perhaps like drones being used in apartments to, to monitor apartments in Israel. To see, uh, to see that um, you know people are, 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 or Israeli drones being that people are staying in place as they're supposed to be, um, mm -hmm. you know, under quarantine or so. Or mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the Gates Foundation um, working with I think a un I think Stanford University and another university using these kinds of um, it's almost like shot spotters, but for like gunshot detection, but for coughing, <laughs> but but you know, but, but to see that um, uh, measuring COVID coughs. As if mm -hmm. those those ways that certain I mean these are these kind, are of, kind of, of impossible things that could be measured, but to make that um, uh, to give it a name like data driven, you know, <laughs> makes it sound real to people. Um, and and so these uh, these kinds of uh, technologies are are things that I'm uh, you know interested in as because of the communities that they're always first tested out on um, that that are that 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 they are really designed um, to um, to surveil with. And so mm -hmm. I think to, to see those two things um, coming together, um, the, the, the case in Los Angeles is, you know, not really one that I know of, but I'm looking forward to, you know, reading the report that, um, that you all just, uh, just mentioned there, because these seems to be uh, a moment when there's, a, I guess, a corona washing as a way of ushering in mm -hmm. uh, a kind of, uh, uh, I guess, acquiescence or a kind of public uh, favor for these technologies. Mm -hmm. Pete, any, any, anything? Not really. I was just uh, I was just thinking about that cough spotter, like a like a shot spotter, and anti blackness, right? So I think about a white cough, a Snow White cough versus a black <laughs> cough, <laughs> and the response, right? Because of the imagery and the the stereotypes that have been laced with blackness, right? I think about. Uh, we were talking, when Jamie was talking, I was thinking a lot about, we live in a city where the mayor, straight up, he's done the math, and he doesn't even have to pretend like he cares about Black people, right? And that reality sort of informing the response uh, to our, in our communities, the policing response in our communities, right? Um, that reality allowing Metro Division year in, year out, um, just profiling Black drivers of any age and pulling them over, right? It's that anti-Black sentiment um, that is ingrained uh, in the DNA. And the only time that there is um, some walking back is when we're in the streets, is when we're in their face, is when we are when we are powerful enough at the moment to not essentially be exterminated or put in cages, mm -hmm. right? And so when we think about even the junk science that they use, right, for their systems, we've, we've always said junk in, garbage in, garbage out, right? But it is technological redlining, something that I've talked about a long time right like this is what that is in full display and then the last part just as we we talk about um we talk about um sort of the racialized nature of their operations uh we look at the lapd and their ability to go into communities and to organize groups around this same anti-Black sentiment, which then allows them to pursue those who are deemed expendable. Mm -hmm. And so it's all there, right? It's, it's all there, it's all right in front of us. I think, um, I think a quote that comes to mind for me is uh, something Gary Blasey said. He said, the law is essentially a representative of the voice of the people and or the person in power at the time that law was written. Mm -hmm. So then one thinks, so what laws have we written, mm -hmm. right, that anyone follows and that are important? Mm 
Absolutely. But Absolutely. I think the story that you told at the beginning, that image that you told Pete of the of the hazmat suits and um and some folks saying not today, you know, I'm not gonna be tested today. And those uh those those kinds of refusals are important moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so now we're going to open it up and uh, let's see how, well, whether we get stoned or bombed or whatever <laughs> the things happen, you know, oh. <laughs> you know just uh, um, uh, so, uh, and, and if folks can send a message, I think what we did was, Shakir, I kind of basically opened up the chat room for host only. So if somebody is going to be really, should be wretched, well, let us, let them be wretched with us, you and I, <laughs> you know, as, uh, uh, so let's just, so please, uh, if people have a comment, people want to uh, have a question, please send a quick message and we'll definitely uh, bring you on um, because we also want to just to bring in our, our, our crew about the, the zines that have been released. So any, any, any question or any comments from somebody, please either raise your hand and we'll go there and then, yeah, so we'll just move from there. And in, with the chat, just feel free to say unmute or you don't have to put your whole question or comment there, just say unmute, we can unmute you and then you can speak. Yeah, so let's just, uh, let's go there. Um, okay, so let me just go to uh, Cecia. Cecia, please go ahead. Hi, um, good evening. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Simone, I was just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about um, everything that you were talking about, but just kind of connecting it more to like gender, um, to gender and like sexuality, perhaps kind of expand that conversation to bring in the gender piece. Could you, uh, you said everything that I was talking about, but talk more about gender and sexuality. Could you tell me, like, what do you want to talk about? Oh, she there? <laughs> Uh, she may have unmuted her, uh, muted herself. Here you go, Cecilia. Go ahead and unmute. Okay, go ahead. You're good. Now. Okay, there we go. Yeah, um, I guess I'm just wondering, um, like specific ways that, um, surveillance or contact tracing in the time of COVID might be impacting different bodies. So, specifically, you know, Black women or Indigenous women, um, compared to, um, yeah, we know that you know intersectionality is the thing. We know that. Um, working class um, folks are more vulnerable, right? Um, so just kind of, I haven't seen a lot of folks just kind of connecting the piece around how gender might be impacting um, both workers and communities impacted by um, COVID and, and kind of the tracing or different surveillance technologies that are being used. Or even of uh, who is working on, um, you know, on the front line. I think in LA, like the first um, uh, set of uh, people when they, uh, I guess they opened the city. I'm not too familiar. Someone else will probably chime in. Were um, the women that were um, uh, that are uh, working in people's homes, whether it's to, through childcare or um, you know um, house cleaning and these kinds of like caretaking roles. And I think that um, you know, again, it's like who's who's. Who, whose labor is made disposable um, or is given certain types of value where their, um, you know, their, their lives are, um, you know, kind of placed below labor. Um, you know, I, and in, in terms of, uh, uh, I, of course, like an intersectional approach um, is important to look at uh, when it comes to um, contact tracing. And I'd have to do, you know, more uh, research uh, in, in that in, in what people are, what folks are doing now in this moment and, and which I really have not. I've just, you know, talked about certain technologies that might come into play. Um, but, you know, I, I think back to, um, you know, the stories that I've been reading of, you know, a, a young woman who uh, was a teacher uh, in New York and uh, she was, you know, who's, she wasn't believed um, that she was, uh, that she was ill and had to find her, the ambulance wouldn't take her to the hospital, had to find her her own way um, there and eventually um, she died. And again, it's like these, it's a kind of replication of, of, of many of the same ways in which, you know, when it comes to um, uh, racialized women, Black women, Indigenous women, um, uh, in uh, the American healthcare system, um, this uh, this crisis, uh, which is, I guess, I, I guess as a, uh, Pete said, or it's, a, it's a kind of continuing crisis. Or I think Hamid began the our, our meeting today um, talking about that it's, certain communities are always having in crisis in this white supremacist state. Um, it's just being magnified in this uh, in, in this moment. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Victoria, uh, but we have you unmuted, but before you go, uh, we have uh, West. Uh, so let me just get to, uh, there you are, West. So go ahead, West. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and for giving this awesome presentation. You kind of answered my question already. I was going to ask, like, what kind of messaging is, do you think is most useful to, like, relay to, I guess, like, decision makers? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky for everyone trying to balance, um, you know, having an appropriate public health response with this, with this other thing they're trying to roll out. Um, so, yeah, and also even is how important is that to try to sway decision makers if our power is really in like collective organizing and like what we've been talking about, like um, peer response. Pete, you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think my message is simple. I think my message is take politics and the police out of your public health response, right? Take politics, take police and data sharing out of the public health response, right? Because we continue to see both of those things leading the charge. Um, and in our communities, it really means leading the charge to death in so many ways. Great. Uh, and Kirby and Ken, I see you, uh, have you uh, on stack? And then next we'll go to Victoria. Victoria, you, you've been unmuted. Todd also had a question, is on stack too. I'm sorry? Todd also had a question. Oh, okay, so we'll put Todd on stack as well. So Victoria, go ahead. Let me see. Hi, uh, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for the presentation. My question is related to something um, that was discussed about who gets to drive surveillance and mitigation strategies in the community. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on how coronavirus would shape or affect um, the police's ability to include residents and regular people in the everyday policing and surveillance of their neighbors and how it would change um, as a result of COVID. Is that... Hamid, is that the, are there people well, either one of you, I mean, uh, uh, just so, just go ahead if you. Uh, uh. No, because I, 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 at some point I'd just be like, you know, just guessing. This is the work that you all do. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right, important. right, right. I, I can have opinions on things, but I think it's sometimes other people have, you know, more interesting, uh, thoughtful things to say. Sure, 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 sure. Um, Pete, do you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it just goes back to sort of, I think it's a great question, but I think it goes back to sort of this idea around uh, cough spotters, cough spotting, right? And so, you know, what would the world look like if you are, if you are coughing? And we're not too far away from this world. If you're coughing and one of your neighbors says, I think this person has coronavirus and someone needs to deploy right, EMTs, medical folks, and police to help us out, right? And so it's just like this Aurelian thing. I, I don't want to speak it to existence, but I think all of those things are possible. I, you know, it's really like a no holes bar uh, approach to our communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so things that might seem weird is like, yo, no, we've seen those things in many different ways before. But Absolutely. I think it's maybe to like get away from that, you know, that see something, say something type of, um, uh, you know, kind of snitch state, in, <laughs> but to have more to, of care, like, you know, how can I help you if you're coughing? We know that the recovery for this is, um, you know, very tough and very rough on the body. And so what uh, other ways of support, because some people might not be able to work in the same ways that they, you know, had prior to having this. Um, some people might be, feel isolated. Um, you know, uh, 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 once they have a recovery. Some people might be, um, you know, shunned because they're seen to have uh, a certain type of, um, uh, you know, contagion to them. And we can look to the histories of, uh, you know, other ways in which, um, you know, uh, certain forms of like virus and disease has been, um, you know, policed, but also um, created communities of care, um, you know, uh, uh, in the U.S. and other spaces. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so go ahead, uh, Kirby. Let me just see if we have, because we have Kirby, Ken, and Todd, and then we'll, we'll go into the zine piece. Um, actually, maybe we'll go into the zine piece after Kirby and then come back to Ken and Todd. Uh, there you go, Kirby. 
go ahead if you have a question. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the talk. Hello, Dr. Brown, love your book. I'm a fangirl. Anyway, I wanted to say, what would you suggest um, those of us who kind of really try to work with the police, not as in a reformist capacity, but even getting information about the daily operations to, to, to essentially um, make or to essentially dismantle that predictive policing. Um, the gentleman, Paul, earlier spoke about dismantling predictive policing and working in my city with uh, like just a huge unsheltered population that's constantly being policed. How would you go about actually being a part of essentially counter spying or spying back on the police to kind of be ahead of their operations to to kind of do that work of dismantling predictive policing, if you have any kind of insights to share. A question is for me or the people that have actually done Everybody on the panel. Okay. Everybody, yeah, I was just saying I like you. You're no, thank you so much. For, for, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about the HIPAA violations and knowing that they were doing testing, a lot of the times we don't know of anything until we see it on the street. And so if anybody has any advice on kind of getting ahead of the police or kind of doing some counter spying on them um, in order to kind of, I guess, uh, kind of stalemate their predictive policing power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, so would, would, would love to uh, uh, check in, uh, Kirby. We can, we can uh, maybe what you can do is just uh, send us an email at stoplapdspying at gmail.com. Just one word, stoplapdspying, and then at gmail. And we can basically talk to you in details as to what was the, the fight over, over a period of time that ultimately led to the dismantling of predictive policing in Los Angeles. And what were the tools that were used? What was the, the messaging? What was the, the organizing? What was the building power? Uh, without giving an inch, without negotiating, without compromising anything at all. But it really came down to building community power. And a lot of our folks who were a part of that are on this uh, webinar as well. So we would love to absolutely share whatever resources we can. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, uh, let me just go quickly and Ken, if you can just hang in there, I want to just uh, go ahead and, um, and um, uh, uh, okay, so Nina, I'm going to unmute you and I think, so if mm -hmm. you can unmute yourself, uh, mm -hmm. Nina and Nadia, uh, and then uh, also, I guess, uh, I don't know if uh, Jojo is there or not, and Siomara. So this was our crew that have uh, done this amazing, amazing work. So let me just pull up uh, this zine that is, uh, we are releasing it today. Um, and let me just, uh, yeah, so, so mm -hmm. is. Uh, uh, yes, hello. Is, is, is Nina on? I don't Hey y'all, it's uh, it's Nina. She, her, Aya pronouns. Okay, and um, Nadia and Siomara and Jojo, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we um, um, go go for it, Nina. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So the second uh, issue or the second zine uh, that we uh, made, it's the Building Power Against War on Youth, um, and it's a collaboration with a lot of folks. Um, with uh, Stop LAPD spying, uh, the Palestinian Youth Movement, Justice, Youth Justice Coalition, Baby Anarchists, and Gender Justice, to name a few. Um, but it um, it really talks about how it isn't a moment of time or moment in time, uh, but could, uh, but a continuation of history, and that's something that um, it's uh, it's not something that um, it's an isolated incident but it's something that is part of like a uh, crisis that we've seen throughout uh, the um, illegal occupation of this land um, and then I want to well, first of all start by saying uh, we want to honor um, that like we are currently in occupied land or we're in stolen Tongva land um, so that's part of um, uh, the first page of the it, the first page of the zine is an open letter to uh, dedicated to the the youth in revolt and our ancestors, but also the the inner child. Um, so 
it's uh, really setting uh, that tone for uh, wanting to acknowledge um, the fact that we, regardless of all the, the trauma and all the um, different forms of um, white terrorism or white supremacy um, and colonialism and, and all the other forms of oppression, we're still here um, and we continue to, to resist. I don't know if Nadia, you want to add mm -hmm. anything to, to that? Yeah, uh, thanks, Nina. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Nadia. Uh, she hers. And um, yeah, thank you for thank you for the panel today and today's discussion. And, and yeah, just kind of building on um, on what Nina's sharing. Really, like one of the things uh, we also hope to do with the zine is um, is really rooted in knowledge sharing and knowledge exchange. It's really um, it, it comes from that sentiment and what we need we need to do what we want to do and so um so just inviting people also to give their feedback or if you have ideas or if you want to be part of creating the, the zine as well um and so so yeah we'll uh you know it's it's up on the website we'll, and there's a printable version too uh and then there's also the resources piece because one of the things is just with a lot of the heaviness of what's happening what has happened what's been you know uh what has been and so with that, our goal is really to build power with this. So building power is about, you know, sharing knowledge, our resources. And so that's, um, yeah. So that, that would be probably what I would add to that. And um, I'm Siomara, and if anybody else wants to add anything, welcome to. Um, yeah, I think like the other thing that I just, along with the resource sharing, um, I think that like, and again, thank you for this, call this was awesome this webinar i think like definitely it, uh, what i love about the past zine and this scene too is just like talking about like bringing in other like the partners that we brought in the highlighting other um coalitions organizations comrades and just like and i think that with the talking about the war on youth and we were talking about the vibrancy and resiliency of youth and, and i think that that's like something that i'm really trying to focus on on in this moment and I think that it's a powerful way for us to think about like resistance and how we're coming together and collective care and just taking care of one another and trying to resist and move forward so yeah is Jojo on there too or maybe not okay so, Nina, anything else? Nina, Nadia, Siamara? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't have anything more to add. Just, uh, yeah, really like, um, just honor, I really just want to honor and appreciate the work and process and creating these past two zines and really looking forward to creating the third. So, yeah, feel free to reach out to the coalition. And um, there's the LA can hand washing stations and all of that. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. All right, there you go. Hey y'all, can you still, can you hear me? Yes, please, go ahead, Nina. Oh, sorry, we were muted for a little bit. Um, but yeah, we it, it goes, the zine goes through a lot of different things. Um, so it goes from like the biological warfare that we've experienced uh, since 1492, um, and how like the colonizers were the, were, were the first to infect the Americas, or the so-called Americas. Um, and that's uh, like it kind of, um, I mean, trying to, to speak that also because a Navajo nation is, is also uh, experiencing a lot of uh, the brunt of um, like the, well, I mean, first of all, this, the virus started by uh, folks that have the privilege and ability to, to fly around um, and who gets to experience the, the violence of that. It's the most marginalized communities uh, but it talks a lot about um, that history of um, that we keep each other safe from the southern state and that the, the state really um, isn't here for um, our collective well-being. And that's reiterated with um, even Mayor Garcetti's proposed budget and how um, it, it puts aside uh, 3.15 uh, 3 billion for the next year for LAPD. Um, but it only does 100 million for housing and for any of the other things that we're asking for uh, instead of um, focusing it, focusing specifically on surveillance and policing. Um, 
instead putting that towards the, the resources that we know uh, will actually help us stay at home and help us protect the folks instead of uh, kind of talking about it as uh, folks that need to, uh, like a, a necessary sacrifice for the economy. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, so, yeah. So just uh, it ends with the, the that timeline of uh, the Stop the Lakeview Spying Coalition's fight to dismantle the Predpol policing uh, program. Um, so I highly encourage uh, folks taking uh, time to to look at that. It's also on the website, um, but it just goes really through that history of that violence um, that uh, the war on youth youth have faced um, since the first bodies were snatched from the shores of Africa uh, to the first indigenous, uh, the, the indigenous uh, children that were uh, forced also through um, with, the, with the church um, and forced into boarding schools to uh, uh, kind, of, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of promote Eurocentric ideology um, with like the save, uh, kill the Indian, save the man. Uh, and that's something that, um, like if you really cared for the well-being of communities, you really would uh, put it towards um, all the resources that would ensure uh, youth and and um, the inner child and our and would honor also the ancestors and the struggles that uh, is not isolated, but it, uh, it affects us through generations and through that trauma as well. So, trying to honor and name uh, that violence and uh, that historic resilience. So. Uh, not only focusing on that, but also how can we con how can we build? Um, so it's a abolitionist framework, but it's how can we creatively uh, make and sustain communities and make sure that we have communal care uh, because the state obviously doesn't care about us because it's never been a state that um, well, it's not a state that started with consent, so it'll really never be for our folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, if Kirby is still listening, so Kirby, here's uh, the, the timeline that uh, it's, it kind of goes to show and we can, we can always follow up with the conversation too, starting back in, so it's almost like a seven year fight for the dismantling, uh, but it kind of lists as to where and how and what all various things we had to basically build and do that. So, but, but thank you so much, uh, Nina and Nadia and Siomara and Jojo and, and Isaac and everybody else for your brilliant, absolutely. And hopefully this is, uh, um, I know uh, Dogon absolutely is, uh, is, is, loves our, our scenes and is always waiting for them to start distributing. So yeah. Um, so I wanna uh, just go to Ken now. Let me just see if Ken's, uh, Ken is your thing. Let me just see, where did Ken go? Ken what is he going to be released? Uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's already on the website. Oh, nice. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So it is on the website, and it has a both. Um, uh, let me just go to that real quick. So it it it, it basically has both the the printable uh, version and uh, and also the uh, uh, online version as well. So so yeah, that's that's where you can do that. Um, where did did we lose Ken? I think so. Uh, let me just see. E F G H I J K. Maybe we may have less can. Okay, so let me just go to Todd. Um, cool. Thank you. There you go, Todd. Cool. Thank you, Todd. Coming up from LA Can. It's nice to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I have a couple of questions that I've, I mentioned this to Pete and a few other people on the call over the last. We on the streets when you walk around and you see that what I've seen at least is that the majority of people and this is an unscientific um, you know observation but um, most of the people who tend to not be wearing masks are black people um, and it's like and they'll even in groups um, in when they're on their own in many different aspects it's like it's just fascinating and it's reflecting like why that actually is happening like why are they why is that happening is it because they're it's about like a rebellious kind of thing an irreverent thing is it that they don't believe that it's actually going to affect them you know pete mentioned earlier that um some people just didn't believe that it was actually there you know it was someone else's disease or something like that um 
So there's that question, and I'm just wondering, just from your observational perspective or your experience, like why that might actually be, what might be driving that? And then the next question is probably understanding that better might inform this one, but we know so much about how public service campaigns uh, actually can effectively change behavior. And why is it that, this may not be an answerable question right now, but like why is it that we have not seen organizations um, especially ones who are who have special interest with uh, black and brown people band together or work with the Ad Council or come up with like campaigns to actually effectively speak to them because part of the what could be happening is the messaging that actually is happening to our greater society is not relevant to black people because it's not culturally relevant it, it doesn't come across in a way that actually makes it familial and makes um, meaningful and memorable so that they actually so it sticks just a hunch and so it's like i just find it it's just that both those things are perplexing to me that there's um that we're like you know we say we're, we, we're losing people meanwhile it's like what are we doing to actually help um uh keep them around so that's my those are my two questions my aunt, that's, that hasn't been my observation or experience I, like i see black people masked up all the time um, and it, uh, and I'm probably just also not outside that much. So perhaps that 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 has changed within the last um, you know eight weeks. That has been more and more that people are um, you know masking up, creating their own masks, organizing, uh, sharing uh, uh, masks that they've uh, created. In terms of the ad council, you know I don't know. So maybe that's something, maybe there are people that do that work, but I know that there are groups that are, that are organizing and supporting and um, doing other uh, webinars and doing things outside of um, Zoom um, to organize and protect communities. And I think the example that we just saw was the zine um, that, was, that has been uh, the 18 pages that we just went through of different ways of you know creating uh, their own fountains to historicizing um, uh, and also making those kinds of connections with various communities um, to think about you know how, how do we conceptualize mutual aid and what that could look like and so it might not necessarily be with the ad counts I don't watch that much US TV so I don't really know what's going on there but um, but I do see you know in other spaces online um, that people are organizing um, communities of care and support and resistance and survival Thank you. Pete, do you want to add anything to that or? No. Already? Okay. Anybody, anybody else? Any other questions? Let me just quickly see there's some messages in here as long as those messages are. Uh, okay, all right. Okay, that seems to be going well. Um, uh, Angela, did you have your hand up? I, I thought you just... Uh, I'm, I'm unmuting you if you have a question or a comment. Um, just to comment um, in support of everything everyone else has said, and, and that is you know, to, just to remember that the struggle is ongoing. And uh, and I just wanted to share that I know firsthand that, that um, things like Amazon and the, the way that the workforce of Amazon and those drivers, delivery drivers are organized, um, the fact that they are so black, right? Um, I know that folks that are labor organizers also know that, right? And so I've recently been contacted by a few who are seeking um, folks to infiltrate and organize among Amazon. So just, you know, for me, it's, it's always important to, to recognize the opportunities and that folks are taking advantage of those opportunities, even as we, we recognize how daunting the things that challenge us are. Thank you. Uh, Michella, I'm uh, sorry, I just noticed that you had your hand up. So uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Hey, all. Um, so this is not a question. Just to say that, Pete, how you doing? Um, hey. ma'am. Yeah, I was enjoying what both of y'all were saying. I just want to encourage all of us to think of the people that are you know y'all know me. People who know me, Ch Chelly's gonna keep it real. 
um, I encourage us to think of those who are at the bottom of the bottom, right? Um, I love that there was a, a saying about people who are disposable, right? Um, I, I also think of people who are disposable within those people that aren't disposable, right? Which means people who are, who are, who are affected by COVID, right? People who are elderly, people who are disabled, who cannot speak for themselves. I was just on a call earlier with um, Be Heard, which does a lot of work with uh, inmates and prisoners that are in jails that are disabled and deaf. So even thinking of that, and then of course, I'm going to bring it black trans women who are like really being forgotten and left out of the conversation. Um, I think it's imperative, imperative that if we don't work from the ground up, we are not going to see freedom. So we cannot do this without our, without our disabled brothers and sisters and siblings. We cannot do this without black trans women who are actually still fighting for black men who are getting murdered, right? Um, yeah, so whatever y'all need to do, this is just a challenge with love to center trans black women, whatever y'all need to do to um, uh, center disabled black and deaf folks, do that in your work. That is it, Chella out. <laughs> Thank you, Chella. Thank you, Chella. Any any comment from uh, either Simone or Pete? Well, you know, no one is disposable. I think that's the systems like try to, to make that the case, but um, you know, no human is, being is disposable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, next one we have uh, L'Oreal and, and and Michelle. I see you too. I'll come to you in a second. So let me just uh, go to L'Oreal. Please go ahead. Yes. Hey y'all, really enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate you, Dr. Brown. I'm halfway through the book. I read like 10 books at a time, so uh, get to it. <laughs> I have, uh, like in this conversation, um, there's like an online tracker for like fines and tickets that are getting for like being out or breaking some of the policies that are being put out. And that's like to the panelists, but also to the people in the uh, um, So I'm asking about online tracker of tickets and fines nationwide that's happening. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Um, so got a got a text uh, uh, from uh, from uh, uh, Bita about that uh, um, that we're looking at the persistence and foundational nature of anti-black racism to the country makes any public health surveillance risky, and 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 subject to reformist uh, public health counter to community power. So. So in a sense, um, I think there's, there's absolutely this concern and, and it, it's not coming from, because I think the way at least, uh, and the coalition fully m uh, moves with that understanding as well, that, the, that, it's, that policing and any structural system within the United States, given the deep anti-blackness, it is based on the intent to cause harm. It is not based on, on, on supporting life-affirming institutions. It's not based on affirming life, but it's really based on with the intent to cause harm. So I think in a, in a sense, is it, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it's a word we should use, it's a quandary that's been created, whether it's a, it's, 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 it's a trap that has been set up, it's, it's the, the stage that is being set. I mean, it comes back to that, the design part of that. So, so what message is, how do we then, and I think it'll be, it'd be great if we can end the conversation on that as to that, like where to, because now we are being asked to submit. We're being asked to like, you know, that it's a life-saving device, submit to surveillance, give us your information. So what do you, where do we go from here? Where's Pete? <laughs> Is he, oh, he's not there. So someone no, has their hand out there. Yeah, he's here. Go ahead. Uh, no, I'm here. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking about, I was thinking about your introduction in your book, um, Dr. Brown, and really being a fan student of the many sort of faces of the known um, to this question. I was thinking of something I read way early in life when Fanon mm -hmm. 
in um, Retro from the Earth and the numbers on you abusing that faith. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, um, that was that was Yvonne Michelle. We heard you, Yvonne, um, <laughs> for sure. So, so one of the one of the quotes, uh, and I think is just for this moment, is when Fanon said, "The numbers of people who are experiencing hardship." I'm paraphrasing, are the exact numbers of individuals who have no solutions. And so I think it's I don't think it's us waiting on one person. Um, I don't think it's us waiting on someone to emerge with the answers. I think it's all about organizing, organizing our data, organizing our story, organizing our power, and organizing our set of demands to tip this whole thing over. And while, and while that might sound ambitious for some, when I look at the work of Stop LAPD Spying and other local organizations who simply said, we will not submit to reform. And at the end of two and three year struggles, because these struggles aren't short, actually get what we were shooting for. Those should be the North Stars that we are aiming our gaze towards. I think as long as we're organized, I think as long as we're after power, we'll be okay. It's the moment when we accept, or it's the moment, because we know, like we're having a conversation about knowing what they want us to do, wanting us to submit. And our full scale refusal to submit is what the first order of the day is. Simone? I think, I think the last question that was asked before that, like what happens to that data um, for the ticketing, um, for any type of um, you know, biological data that we, that we give up, uh, so I think those kinds of questions that to, to the refusal, but also to like to keep on asking um, around questions of consent, privacy, and what happens to um, uh, you know all these kinds of tracings that are happening around this uh, COVID nineteen and and whatever else will be to come. I think looking at those you know the the histories that have been mapped out in the zine that uh, you just showed us, and to continue to ask questions, continue to look at moments of support. And I think that's the that's the the the, the challenge, but also um, you know a space of hope as well too. Okay. And uh, uh, we have a couple more hands that went up. So let's go to Austin. Then uh, Go ahead, Austin. Hi, hello. Yes. Hi, um, I had a question. Um, with the discussion of this system, of this state of policing, and this full-scale refusal to abide by these rules, um, what, does that, what, does, what does that refusal look like um, in the next coming months as we reopen? Um, what does this refusal look like? <laughs> I think that's a really great question because it's like who can who can there are a lot of people refusing to wear masks, you know, refusing to to to, to protect the communities around them, um, and uh, and and making claims on um, uh, you know a, a, a oppression which which is not really happening, and so um, the, the the question of like what's at stake when you make when you make claims to re to refuse um, is is a is a really uh, important one, but I, mean, I but I think for me it's like refuse being abused, <laughs> refuse being uh, ignored by a, by a healthcare system, um, refuse that, uh, that, that the refusals that we get from those systems that don't serve us. And, and then maybe that's the space that, uh, that, that we can start with. Mm -hmm. I say, and I think it goes back to the, um, you know, that, uh, that important reminder that we were given a few comments um, ago about who we center um, in these moments that no, that no human, nobody is disposable. And so when we center um, Black trans women, when we center people who a system has made disabled and the structures around us, uh, in th those are the, the moments that we get to freedom and survival um, you know, out of this that we're, that we're in right now into something different. Mm -hmm. Pete? No, I, I think I would just say I concur, and I would all, I would also say the refusals that I'm talking about is pre-COVID and post-COVID, right? The types of refusals, um, refusing to accept narratives uh, that are rooted in anti-blackness, the refusal to carry those narratives in divisive manners that sort of um, 
um, stifles our power building across communities, right? And so it doesn't have to look like, yo, I refuse to turn around and put the handcuffs on today and I'm about to put hands back on you. I don't think it starts there. I think it starts with the shifting of the way we think about things and the small things. Mm -hmm. And I think if I could add to that too, that uh, refusal is also a practice. Um, and I think, and, and how do we flip the script? Because what I, what I would say is that I would also claim that, you know, when we do uh, Wellness Wednesdays and when we do Sunday Strongs uh, in Skid Row at LA Camp, that's a refusal. That's a refusal that we will not submit to the system. We will not submit to the system that, that basically is completely absent and intentionally absent and intentionally there with the to cause harm. So our refusal is also in action and in practice and in thought as well. So in a sense, our fight against not being reformist is a refusal to a system that requires you to constantly submit and, and give you, throw you a few crumbs and then, okay, well, just negotiate and compromise. That's also refusal too. So it's a great question, Austin, and thank you so much for asking that because that's exactly the call to action we want to leave this conversation with today. Like, you know, that no, we, I refuse to submit and I, I would not negotiate and compromise. So last couple pieces, um, uh, Mustafa, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. So go ahead if you have a, unmute your iPhone and if you have a question. Go ahead, Mustafa. Hi, um, <clears throat> this is Mustafa. I'm a PhD candidate in informatics at UC Irvine in OSI. I really appreciate the um, conversation and presentations today. I've really enjoyed them. Um, one point that um, Dr. Brown brought up um, was the when when we were talking about um, the police dashboards, the mapping of sentiment across geography. The um, I'd like to sort of just expand on, maybe clarify what what that can be how it can be conceived academically speaking and theoretically speaking, um, which is that there's this thing that I'm familiar with. I, I know it as the Latourian miracle. I also call it sort of an epistemic knot. It's when you have a theory and then that theory guides data collection and then the data collection confirms the theory. And that's sort of, it's a miracle, right? The theory proves itself. Um, and it creates this knot um, that makes it difficult to see outside of that framework. And so um, as we, you know, refusal, I think, is a, is a really great step. And I, I'm interested in knowing if we know about, are there alternative ways of being that have been foreclosed, alternative ways of structuring society, um, maybe different institutions, but maybe also non-institutional and what does it sort of look like and how do we move, you know, from refusal to there or if, you know, it's not a stepping stone process, what that sort of looks like, um, if, if, you know, you thought about that at all. Um, Dr. Brown and others, if you have thoughts on that, thank you. Well, Mustafa, what does that look like to you? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, and I, I don't know. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it has to do with like the pre-colonial societies that have that you know did exist, but and and what can be reclaimed through the archaeological record as well as through um, you know the families and the and the nations that live on. Um, I admit that I don't know much about it, um, and so I'd like to hear. A little bit about that if, if you have anything well uh, you know uh, one thing i do is stay in my lane and if i don't much know much about stuff I, but i think what you're, you're giving us some spaces where we can go and and look for and, I, and again i point you back to um the zine that we were just showed um in this moment that 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 traces um uh, that centers um I indigenous um people that centers a history but also a present in the collective effort um uh not only to um 
uh, to challenge uh, these COVID times, but to, to survive uh, and, to, and to thrive and to build something new. And I think that's, uh, that's the space where, um, you know, those, um, uh, uh, the, the, I think it was like four or five people that presented <laughs> to us, but I think that's where I would look to for those answers. And it doesn't necessarily, for me, have to, to, to go into like a space of, uh, I mean, you started your question about talking about, let's bring it back into academia. And I think that <clears throat> there's some moments where like this zine is academic work too. And I think that's like, that's important um, uh, in the, in the, in, and to look for uh, answers or the type of, you know, the questions that we ask and who we center as knowledge producers in this moment is, is very important. And I think that, um, you know, uh, when Jamie talked about the way that um, this certain report, which I'm not familiar with, centers academic language as an alibi for getting away with Fred Pohl and other types of like uh, violent police practicing, but I don't think we need to challenge that with like, let's think about affect theory, you know what I mean? But let's look at like what, what, uh, what, is, what has been presented, um, you know, in this moment in these conversations we're having here. Thanks, Thanks so much. What are you muted? Uh, so, so Michelle, if you want to quickly make a quick comment because we're in the last minute or so, go ahead. I, uh, you're unmuted, Michelle. Uh, I think Michelle may be having trouble unmuting the phone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, please, if you can just quickly make a comment if that you wanted to. Yes, thank you. I'd like to thank um, Professor. And I also like to thank uh, Pete, always um, so grateful for the information and the enlightenment that you're providing as we're all continuing to reach out and connect and, um, and prevail through this. Um, so I have one question, of course, in the complete ab abolishment or absolution, um, abolition of the system or the infrastructure, which is imminent, I think, you know, with the COVID, this is the beginning um, of, of revolutionary uh, uh, efforts, I think that the creator is using to, to move out all that is um, unjust. What will be implemented in its stead? I, you know, I'm a Black Panther Vanguard member, so I do know about the practical means that the Panthers had for um, taking control of our communities. I ask that because I have neighbors that abuse, you know, babies and women. And so as a single black woman, who would I call now? I'm a member of core member of LA Can, and I appreciate brothers looking out for me, you know, but on the real, when it's sometimes members of the community that might try to exploit me because I am a single dwelling black woman. So that's one question. And then I do have one comment again, thank you so much for the information. Um, as COVID, I, I do believe might've been genetically engineered targeting black people, that technology exists. And uh, 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 and also uh, the technology, of course, for uh, like as Tuskegee, those experiments for intentionally injecting or infecting our people. It's biological, um, ethnically coded um, vaccines and um, germ warfare. Um, I'm just again encouraging all of us to Thank strengthen you. the immune systems naturally. But again, what would be you know the recourse? I, I mean, practically until the, the system has been completely abolished. Strengthening Thanks. our connection. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, well, that's uh, that leaves us with a lot of uh, reflection, a lot of thought, a lot of something that we've all been all been working on. Um, I just want to uh, open, see if uh, Simone, Pete, Pete, I'm going to unmute you. See if you have any any closing comments, uh, Simone. Well, thank you. This has been a wonderful discussion, and um, I really. Um, uh, you know, to be in conversation with Pete and you has been great. And, and when it, I've just, I've, I've learned a lot from what you all brought in um, uh, with the, the, the audiences brought in. I'm looking forward to getting into more of uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I'm, I mean, I, I, I think I'm my, final, my final comments is lifting both um, Shella and Michelle, um, making sure that we go into the, the bottom bottom, the low bottoms, right? Uh, making sure that our work reaches all of those in our stead is one. The other thing is, um, you know, we have to go back to some of our practices, um, the good ones, not the bad ones, and taking care of one another while we're building power and not uh, replicating 
a system that devours us and devours our humanity. Nice. So I want to just also uh, put a shout out for this um, this um, uh, uh, webinar that is being organized by LA Can. This is on May 21st, Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific. It's the Communities of Color Challenge COVID-19 Nationwide. Uh, it's going to be a powerful discussion with uh, Dr. Armin Henderson. He was, if you all remember, it, it went viral when he was uh, he was uh, uh, physically removed for passing out masks and, and and hitting the streets. As a physician, reaching out to the unhoused community, we have Dr. Blackstock, uh, and then of course our own Nana Jamfi, who is the executive director of Black Alliance for Just Immigration. And of course, we can't get away from Pete. So he's <laughs> also I'm trying to get away from Pete. <laughs> <laughs> also on the panel as well. So, so please dial in. This is also on uh, uh, the Congress website, uh, and you will be able to get Zoom information and or, or uh, just uh, just send an email or or, or 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 search for this for this information. So, with that, I want to just thank you all for for just hanging in there. This was a brilliant conversation. Um, thank you very much, Simone, all the way from uh, visiting family in Toronto for making time. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Shakir. Thank you to Jamie and, and everybody else, Chella and everybody else. And, and really, really, really just appreciate uh, everything that was said and shared. And, and, and please tune in next Tuesday, same time at six o'clock. Um, which will be a, a, a working webinar. So get your uh, working boots on because we are going after this data-driven, data-informed handbook. And that's a target to be dismantling. It may take another seven years, but hey, you know, who said that, you know, we, okay, three years. All right, Jamie, so I stand corrected, three years. But, but this is the way because we cannot let them silence us. We cannot let them disrupt us. We cannot let them, we refuse. We absolutely refuse. Um, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I see Jed here on the screen as well, just doing some awesome work about services, uh, uh, not sweeps campaign and, 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 and working tirelessly. So next Tuesday, 6 p.m., uh, May 26th, let's, let's get, down, then get down to work and, and let's dismantle this one. So thank you very much. Have a good night. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.